Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation in memory of Richard Hefner, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Angelson Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Joan Gantz Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, Carnegie Corporation of New York, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. America's premier hub of visual expression is the renowned Art Institute of Chicago, recently rated the best museum in the world. And today we're delighted to welcome the president of its prestigious school. Former director of the National Science Foundation, president emeritus of Morehouse College, and former chairman of Bank of America, Walter Massey has proven an inspiring leader across a great range of the American endeavor. A PhD trained physicist, Massey's scientific background has uniquely informed the Art Institute's laboratory of learning. His presidency continues the decades-long pursuit to impart the extraordinary work by the likes of Edward Hopper to the next generation. To start, I want to ask Walter Massey how he has infused his passion for science into the future of American art. Does art possess the same power to shape our public imagination in an age of new media? And what do he and the Institute consider the most important influence of art today? These are the questions I hope my guests will grapple with during our program. And Walter Massey, thank you so much for being here. Pleased to be here. What has been the most important aspect of your vision for the Art Institute, given your, your very rich background and legacy in science? Well, I should say, I did not come to the School of the Art Institute to try to impose a vision. I mean, it was already a wonderful historic institution. We will be celebrating our 150th anniversary uh, to, in 2016. So I, I'm going into my fifth year. I think one of the things that I have been able to do in the area of art and science because of my own background in the sciences is to really accelerate what, what had already been conversations about the connection between art and science, the similarities, the differences, the way the two disciplines might, people in the two disciplines might collaborate across boundaries, what might come out of that. So I've been able to sort of push that forward. And I'm very pleased with that. I remember when I first arrived, interesting story. Uh, you did mention I was also uh, director of the Argonne National Laboratory, where the, the first atomic reactor was uh, developed by Enrico Fermi, who was the first director. And my first day on the job at the School of the Art Institute, two faculty came in and said they wanted to tell me about a project they were working on at the school. I said, OK, what is it? They were working on a project with Argonne. I said, how, how could this happen? A school of art and design working with a, a research, national research laboratory. But they were. So there's already things going on. But now we have an ongoing series called Conversations on Art and Science. And what we do is we try to ask questions about what these relationships might be. We don't want it to be a facile conversation. If you Google art and science, you will see hundreds of references uh, to art and science. Some, I think, oversimplified. Uh, so we're trying to explore the complexities of the relationships between these two areas. And not to simplify it, but do you think, generally speaking, that there's a unified vision, a humanitarian ethos among scientists and artists? I'm not sure how to answer that. Uh, I think the, the primary, arts and, the arts and sciences are different. I want to start with that in terms, of, in terms of the way individuals in those areas look for what they call truth, 
uh, look for what they uh, call answers to the questions they are seeking. To me, what's similar is the way they, what motivates them to seek answers, the way they pursue it, the passion with which they pursue those questions, and the sort of commitment they have to their engagement with the arts or the sciences. Both of these areas are very difficult. I mean, it's not easy to be an excellent artist and even, I know what it takes to be uh, even a run of the mill, run of the mill physicist. So one needs passion, the commitment, and the curiosity. And I think those, I know, I've seen those that they cut across boundaries. So the, the interesting issues are then when you bring these two together, are there things that neither discipline or people in either area might think about or explore that now uh, opens up new ways of thinking about the world? New ways and we've of thinking shifted about towards a very public intellectual orientation in the way we think about science and art and an interdisciplinary approach, something that you're a proponent of. We have, we have. But, uh, that's become, I think, fairly common now. Sometimes, again, it's maybe oversimplified. You bring a physicist and an artist together and call it interdisciplinary, maybe multidisciplinary, but actually trying to find ways for them to work together uh, to bring the best of, of both areas together is uh, something that's happen, uh, happening more and more often. In fact, I just uh, attended a session last night, this is so timely, uh, between students from the University of Chicago, many of whom are in the sciences, and students from the School of the Art Institute, and they were coming together to look for ways in which they might collaborate on joint projects. And these are graduate students. I don't think we would have seen as much of that as we see now when I was in graduate school because getting a PhD in physics or any science is sort of a total commitment and anything that distracts is, can be seen as ancillary. And artists are in their studios. The most difficult thing <laughs> I find about our students is to get them out of their studios. And so or the laboratory. Out of their laboratory when you're, the when you're a scientist. So to see the young people, these are not faculty, graduate students, seeking out each other to try and to find ways in which they can explore uh, issues beyond their, their particular area of expertise. I think it's, it's a glimpse of the future. You said that artists and scientists do drive at a, a different end goal, a different achievement that they have in mind. But from what you're saying, it sounds like the young generation is more socially minded, more, more focused on outcomes if they're going to do a laboratory experiment, if there's a particular problem that they have in mind, they're thinking about the larger implications for society. I think that's true. I can't prove that. I think that's you find more of that now, just as you find in the sciences there uh, is more of a tendency to collaborate even in sciences because the problems now maybe require you to bring different disciplines. Let's just say even in science, biology and physics and math and, and chemistry together, uh, and I think artists are collaborating also across different areas, you know, painting, sculpture. But what I'm, I know at the School of the Art Institute, they're very committed to call social practices. That is, looking for ways in which art not only satisfies some aesthetic uh, feelings or the needs, but how art can change the world, how it can affect it for the better. And I, you are right. I do think that you see more of that among young people across all the areas and in the sciences also. In an op-ed that you wrote, you challenged this old paradigm and you said that your current curriculum at the Institute yes. is focused on an interdisciplinary approach to art, design, and innovation. And you continue, as an example, sculpture students are asked to take writing seminars. And from your experience, interfacing with the scientific community are enough scientists taking those writing courses. You're seeing more of that, you are, uh, in particular at, again, our neighbor here at uh, the University of Chicago. With, where you with, were a faculty Where I was member. also there for quite a while. You're right, you're seeing more of that, that students, graduates, undergraduates, I think, have always done that, of course, mm -hmm. uh, in any school that has a liberal arts curriculum. And I should mention, that even at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, we have a liberal arts program. Most people don't know that. We perhaps don't talk about it enough, but they take about 
a third to a quarter to a third of courses in the liberal arts, the humanities and writing and so forth. But we're seeing that now even in the sciences where students are being urged, graduate students, to go outside of their laboratory, their, beyond their computer, and take, uh, engage in activities that are more connected with the, the, uh, the, ex the world beyond the sciences. How has the definition of art evolved since you started? Now, I'm not an art historian. <laughs> I've been in this, at the school for my fifth year, so the world, the, our world of the art is a new one to me in many ways, so I can't comment on how it's evolved over, over historically, but I'm not sure that from what I know and have learned, I'm not sure there ever was a time when art was only seen to be viewed on the walls in museums. And it's, it's, and it's certainly not true now, as I said earlier. Uh, the social practice, engagement with the community is really what we teach at the school, and I think you'll find that generally true throughout the, art, uh, the arts community. And this was something I didn't appreciate as much as I do now having you know, being in the school. I think many people may see students who are studying to be artists as people who are going to be isolated in a studio, starving <laughs> in the cold, passionately creating that work which they hope would be a masterpiece. Mo there are going to be some of those, but most of them really want to engage with the community. They see their art as a way of affecting change and a way of communicating issues which might be difficult to communicate in, in other ways. We have a program in art therapy, and one of the most moving uh, exhibits that we have is when the clients, these uh, individuals who might have different disabilities or learning styles, uh, put on a show at the end. And you can see how dealing in art has changed their lives. And we have a uh, number of our faculty who work out in the communities you know, in local communities in Chicago, working with youngsters and elderly people, using art as a way of helping them deal with issues in their communities. As an institution, the Art Institute and the school at the Art Institute seem uniquely poised to carry forward activism, community engagement leading to activism, leading to whatever our perception of progress is. It, has the Art Institute been a unique instrument, from your point of view, in carrying forward the potential for social change? So one of the things I've learned is being a president of an institution, that's what you say, does the school, because the school is composed of faculty and students, so I'll speak you know, on behalf of what sure. I see them doing. That, historically, the School of the Art Institute, I think, has been known for uh, for its excellence, of course, in the arts, the painting and drawing department is probably one of the oldest and best in the country. But it's also been known for its interdisciplinary curriculum. That's what, there are other very good arts and design schools in the country, but if you ask about us, that's us. We are interdisciplinary, and the other part of it, it's been a socially engaged institution. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's been true throughout his history in various ways. So now, the ways in which individuals become socially engaged through their art may have evolved over the years. Now you will see it more in the students out in the community, faculty working out in the community and local organizations. You mentioned the web, of course, more and more connections that take place through social media and in the, on the web also. But that's uh, something that seems to infuse uh, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, the idea that art is not something, an isolated endeavor to be practiced by oneself alone. That is a way of engaging issues in the world and engaging them in a way that maybe only art can, can uh, uh, lead to a, a different kind of understanding. In science, you can understand issues in one way, Art, you can understand them in different ways. In and perhaps working together, you can understand these issues even better. In terms of the social problems that a community like a large metropolis like Chicago faces, but nationally, what's your aspiration for the young people who are at the school? I'll answer that, but I want to start with more fundamental things. What sure. I think our students should take away, and no matter what 
uh, endeavor you practice, first of all, I want them to be the very best they can be at what they do. Because I have a long-standing philosophy that it's, it's, you can contribute more to society if you yourself are very well prepared. And I sort of went through this evolution as a black physicist younger when I had to balance between being socially engaged and really mastering my field. And so I want them, I don't want them to get our students to begin to think they can go out and change the world just because they're in art school. They can help do things in the world better if they become a better artist, a better designer, and they are excellent and masters at their craft. Having said that, <laughs> uh, we want them to see that their art can make a difference, not only to them, but to others. Now, every artist is not going to change the world, and even working with a few people may, can make a difference. But we, that's what I think I would like them to see. And I have office hours once a month, for students, mostly for students, but anybody can come in. And so they will come by and speak to me about what they want to do, where they see their art taking them. And, and it's very interesting to see, and I think it is a sign of a, a, a new generation, that they really are already thinking about how to use their art. And I'm not sure that would have been, in society, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that would have been true when I was in school. Well, I want you or to maybe put even your, when you were in school. <laughs> <laughs> I want I want you to put your scientific hat back on for a minute, okay. if, you, if you can, and and think about the challenges we face in that discipline and in the wider arena. What are some of the benchmarks of progress that you haven't seen in your lifetime in terms of how science, the scientific process, can aid society, can cure disease, can uplift? the spirit of our country and our people? I think the contributions that science has made to society as a large are probably so evident. Society as a large is, even though we, we have issues of poverty, issues of health, is, health, is healthier than we have been in the history of mankind. The ability, people who have food, shelter, water, housing, is more than we've had in the history of mankind, even in areas of, of, great, of, of great poverty. So the, the, uh, the uh, contributions of science to society, I think we can pretty well establish across all areas. What we, what the challenge, so it's a sort of different challenge, the challenge is to science to sort of better understand the problems uh, that we still have not mastered. Some of those have to do with the universe around us, how it's evolving, you know, where it's going, large, sort of meta issues. The others uh, on the application side, how do we bring more quickly to bear the discoveries in science to areas of medicine? How do we use nanotechnologies, which is happening, you know, to understand uh, and uh, our bodies better? And how do we use new areas of technology uh, to, to improve the human condition? And that requires, scientists can't do that alone. Mm -hmm. That requires scientists working with practitioners in all other areas. You can see the pace of life nanosecond by nanosecond on the internet in terms of how you access information. So I very much relate to what you're saying. Is the scientific process that you were familiar with and that students have undertaken over the course of the last half century, is it obsolete? Is the, is the scientific process obsolete in, in conveying that truth to the greatest number of Americans in pursuit of more knowledge and in pursuit of cures for disease? Well, the scientific process, as you call it, no, it's not obsolete. It's sort of uh, the, the, the scientific methodology, right? There's a, a, a commitment to honesty in what one pursues, a sort of a commitment to openness and sharing one's results so that they can be validated and a, uh, a commitment to pursuing the problem until you can find a solution or at least reveal that there's another path to follow. So the, pr the process when I, doesn't change. When I, get, when I use the word obsolete, yeah. and maybe I'll parse my words okay. here, I'm really referring to the, the process by which, which can be a glacial process of scholarship and publication 
and trials. And we see now... Oh, you mean the way scientists I, I are think validated the, the, or trained. The, I think the, the process, not mm. in the methodology as mm. much as how it interfaces with society. And, and can the speed at which that occurs pick up? Because a lot of people said by 2014 or 2015, there would be a cure to X, Y, and Z disease. And I know you come from a less biological background than, than a physicist's uh, background, but that's why I'm asking the question. The progress in moving si the, the, the discoveries in science from the laboratory to the, to the uh, uh, benefits to society has speeded up tremendously, almost exponentially, even in my time, mm -hmm. my career. I mean, the fact that you can, let's take clinical trials. You now can do a sort of computer base. You can't do the clinical trials, but you can search for drugs, you can search for combinations using the vast computer power and find uh, drugs, pharmaceuticals that can be pinpointed to particular maladies or diseases. That would have been impossible 10, 10 years ago. And now we, we can construct new materials from the atomic level, you know, like this on this table that you would have to go into vast chemical bats years ago to do. So the pace is astounding. Mm -hmm. Maybe what is happening is that the public has been spoiled <laughs> to, to believe that there's a cure for everything that can be found instantly. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's just, that's not true. Uh, many diseases, uh, uh, have been cures for many diseases. You know, it, what, 15 years ago, who would have thought AIDS HIV would be under control to the degree it is now. And so all of that's happening. So, and I think it's going to speed up. Uh, so I, that doesn't bother me so much. I thought you were asking another question about should we change the process by which scientists become scientists. That's going to take time. It takes time to master things. And if you want to master them, well, it Well, your takes answer time. is definitely reassuring. Do correct me. You know, if, <laughs> if, the, yeah. if the pace is... Um, not only where it should be, but leading in the right direction. Oh, it's a much, it is. The University of Chicago, who I've been associated also for a number of years, just started its first engineering program in the history of the school. Never had one. Uh, and it's in molecular engineering. And that means how do you build things on the molecular, or even sub-molecular, atomic level up to create um, new material, biological, physical, and so forth. That, the field didn't exist, you know, 10 years ago. In fact, I think this may be the second uh, one in the country. So the pace at which science is moving, I think is mind boggling. And before you go, I have yeah. one final question. In a terrific, terrifically engaging and grossing speech that you gave at Washington University, one of your alma maters, um, you emphasize the importance of, of liberal education. Why is liberal education still the most fundamental rule that the academy should abide by? Well, it's a product of my, I'm a product of a liberal education, so maybe I'm biased. But I really do believe that a foundation in the liberal arts, a liberal education that allows one to explore across fields, and not just explore, really have some grounding in different areas, uh, teaches one that there are other possibilities in life. I came from a small, segregated town in Mississippi. Without that, I wouldn't have even known probably some of the uh, opportunities, uh, not, I don't mean vocational opportunities, intellectual, cultural opportunities, wouldn't have known that they existed. The other thing it does, and I think I assert in that that uh, talk is that it teaches you how to learn. And that's something you can do for the rest of your life. And I, I think that's uh, one of the greatest values that any human being can have. Walter Massey, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. It <laughs> went so fast. I enjoyed it. <laughs> and thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, Keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash open mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other Open Mind interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming.
Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation in memory of Richard Hefner, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Angelson Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Joan Gantz Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, Carnegie Corporation of New York, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.